Thank you so much, Chairman Smith. Thank you, Co-Chair Merkley. And I want to thank all the CECC staff for organizing this important hearing on Tibet. Um, it's a great honor to speak here um, next to my colleagues, uh, and especially speaking alongside the democratically elected Prime Minister of Tibet in exile, uh, Sikyong Uh It's also very inspiring to be here in this room today uh, with some of the most active members of the Tibet movement who are right here in this room, especially one of the most inspiring uh, heroes of the Tibet movement, a former political prisoner, Ngawa Sangdula. I just saw her sitting over there. <clears throat> Ngawa, Ngawa Sangdul started fighting for Tibet when she was 12 or 13 years old and went to Chinese prison for simply participating in a nonviolent protest. Uh, today, she's still out here fighting for the same cause. Oppression produces exile. All oppressed nations have a blessing called diaspora, where stateless exiles are able to enjoy freedom of expression, religion, assembly, and association that they are denied back home. Once upon a time, Tibetans in the diaspora also enjoyed these freedoms. But in the last decade, many of these freedoms have succumbed to the long arm of the Chinese government, from Nepal and India to Sweden and Switzerland. And now, even in Canada and the United States, formal and informal agents of the Chinese government are using some of the oldest tactics of manipulation and some of the newest technologies of repression to bully, threaten, harass, and intimidate Tibetans into silence. To fully grasp why and how China's apparatus of transnational repression targets Tibetans, we must understand its origins. China has historically viewed the Tibetan diaspora as a leading threat to its global reputation. In the 90s, the international Tibet movement was quite successful at exposing China's human rights violations and generating bad PR for the regime. This was undermining Beijing's foreign policy objectives. It was during this period that the Chinese government launched a new campaign to clean up its global image. But instead of improving its human rights record on the ground, Beijing decided to go after the Tibet movement abroad. China proceeded to develop a sophisticated set of tools, tactics, and strategies to silence not only Tibetans, but also pro-Tibet voices in the international scene. This multi-year project to dislodge Tibet from the global agenda and erase it from public consciousness targets students, activists, artists, academics, former political prisoners, and many elite institutions. Some of my own friends and colleagues in Canada and the United States have gone through traumatizing experiences as a result of being targeted either directly by Beijing or by online mobs of Chinese nationalists who are often acting at the behest of the Chinese consulate. One strategy that Beijing employs with devastating effectiveness is the relationship mapping that links individuals in the diaspora to their families in Tibet. This mapping of family connections allows Chinese authorities to use the fate of relatives back home in Tibet as a pawn to blackmail exiled Tibetans into silence. Two years ago, I interviewed a Tibetan American in New York who had visited Tibet to see her aging parents. She told me how, toward the end of her trip, her minders from the United Front explicitly told her that her political behavior going forward would determine not only her future chances of getting a visa, but also the safety and well-being of her families in Tibet. Her parents are basically the hostage, and her silence in exile is the ransom. It's a ransom she must pay every day by refraining from actions, online or offline, that may be perceived as critical of China. Agents of the United Front or the Chinese consulate unfailingly communicate this exact message to every Tibetan American who visits Tibet or applies for a visa. Most of the time, they don't get the visa. 
This transnational family mapping is designed to manufacture a sense of guilt, let's call it advanced guilt, in the conscience of the exile, making the exile feel that her political participation will endanger her family in Tibet. The ultimate goal of this coercion by proxy is the political deactivation of the exile. Another common Chinese strategy is the weaponization of funding to depoliticize institutions and demobilize communities. This mechanism is visible in the case of Pema Taje, the self-identified Tibetan NYPD officer who was spying for the Chinese government. Exploiting the power of his NYPD uniform, he was trying to manipulate the leaders of the New York Tibetan community. This is what he was saying to them, and I quote, he was saying to the Tibetan leaders, you guys are paying a monthly mortgage of nearly $50,000 for your community center. I have some very wealthy Chinese friends who can help subsidize your mortgage, but you should stop <laughs> flying the Tibetan flag at your events, and you should ban any discussion of political issues at this venue." Unquote. By dangling the promise of funding before the community leaders, Pema Taji was trying to depoliticize and co-opt one of the most important Tibetan-owned spaces in the diaspora. Beyond targeting Tibetan communities, Beijing has used its control, tight control over access and funding to shape political discourse on university campuses, in cultural institutions, academic forums, and even influence the research agenda of budding scholars and aspiring Sinologists. Beijing's apologists out here happily exploit the openness of our democratic systems to defend, ironically defend, the world's largest dictatorship. Nevertheless, I believe there are ways to fight this. The US and the West in general has conceded so much ground to China in the last three decades and moved the equilibrium so far in Beijing's favor it is time to reset the diplomatic baseline, and it's time to go back to first principles of historical truth of Tibetan independence and legal right of the Tibetan people to self-determination. It is time to liberate ourselves from the delusion that sweeping human rights under the rug or throwing Tibetans and Uyghurs to the wolves would somehow make China more likely to cooperate on issues of common interest or geopolitical importance. The best way to counter China's transnational repression is to proactively support the Tibetan, Uyghur, and Hong Kong people's transnational decolonial advocacy for human rights and self-determination, and strengthen the Chinese people's long-standing struggle for democracy and freedom. Thank you. Thank you.